people by and large make emotional decisions about intellectual opportunities. And I quickly understood that if I can tap into people's emotion around an intellectual decision, I could win that game, make $255,000 in five days. I was like, oh, we're going to be winning. What a beautiful country. You get to say, I want something. How do I get it? You're not guaranteed to get it. You can reverse engineer and you take tiny little steps to get there. My dad always said, a country can take away your car, your home, your zip code. They can't take away your knowledge. The more lessons that you learn, the more crystallized your knowledge becomes. You are unmessable with, with crystallized wisdom. And crystallized wisdom only comes on the back of getting punched in the face again and again and again. My whole life, I never had anything to lose. And we built a business and I felt I have now we're everything gonna get taken to away. lose. But I am not special. This is what we all should be doing and what is better will come and I will get better along the way. You choose. Jasmine, we've heard a lot about you, uh, but Adam told me you quit law school. I want to start there. Why did you quit law school? Well, I come from a long line of quitters. <laughs> Ooh, <that laughs> no, legit. And I say that with a sense of pride. Like okay. I was raised in a, I was raised in a household. My dad is an immigrant from Mexico and he came and he said that I had to do jobs and I had to do things that I never wanted to do to make sure that my family was taken care of. Mm. So he's like, if you don't want to do anything, quit. Interesting. Yeah, which is the counter opposite of what most hmm, parents say. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm my husband's family is just like, no, you stick through something all the way through. Right, and right. so I've only ever come from the world of like, life is too short. And when I was 25, my mom was 50. She had been diagnosed with cancer about nine years before. And hmm. the doctors had said, you know, two brain surgeries, chemotherapy, everything we could possibly have done. And they said, it's just time. And so I was in law school. I was struggling with depression. And then all that hit. And I thought to myself, if, if I die in 25 years, I was 25 at the time, my mom was 50. It's like, if I die in 25 years, I don't want to die a lawyer. Mm. I don't want to die so like unhappy. And I thought, oh, how stupid. Who says I have 25 years? I might have 25 minutes. And so all of a sudden, everything came into calibration. And I was like, what do I want to do with my life? Life is too short to be this unhappy. And so I quit. I walked into the dean's office. I was literally on my way to school. I lived on campus. I, went, I had a full ride scholarship to UCLA. Then the bus would pick you up and it would take you into campus. Walked into the dean's office, fully stocked with my 18 pounds of law books. And I was like, I think I'm going to quit. And I said, my mom is sick and I was on scholarship. And she had told me, you have three years to come back and get your scholarship. Go and take care of your household affairs. And I was like, okay. And I thought in my mind, I'll come back. And I never did. Well, you, you just glossed over something I didn't know about. Like you, I didn't know you had a full ride to UCLA. I got, I got accepted to the top 1% wow. of law schools, but I decided to go to LA because I want, I knew my mom wasn't in a great situation and I wanted to be able to you mm -hmm. know, move back and forth as quickly as possible. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. well, now, why law? Was it because, okay, law, lawyer, successful, Stability. immigrant yeah. family? I'm from an immigrant family, so sometimes yeah. you're like, okay, this is a good job, you know, good yeah. career type of deal. Is that why you chose that? A hundred percent. It was like I, um, I, I went to college thinking I was going to get uh, a degree in English. I was like, I really want to write. In my first year, freshman year, I'm in my seminar, and the very first paper I turn into, the professor has it's written up all in red ink. It looks like somebody bled on the paper. And then she says, I want to see you in my office after class. And so I went into her office, and she's going through, and she's explaining what was going on with my writing. And then she had asked me, do you come from an immigrant family? And I was like, oh, yeah, I do. She's like, I can kind of tell by your writing. And right there and then, I was like, oh, my God, you can what can you tell? And I felt like there was like two parallel universes. Mm. It's like the first time that I, my, so I have a twin sister and we ended up going to college. We both got scholarships to go to college. And so it was like the first time in my life that I saw like discrepancy, disparity, a different, a setting apart of. And I thought to myself, oh, I can't, I can't play that game. And so uh, I would start going to the English writing lab, but I had already decided I am not going to play a game where you could tell who I am or what I do by the way that I write. I want to do something that's like pure merit based. Mm. And so I started pursuing things that I was like quantifiable, finance, accounting, and getting a degree in business. Mm. And so you, you you go to you're going to law school. You have this moment. Was it like just a moment? Like that's it. I'm going to quit. Or yeah. was just like a thought process for? Like well, months? I mean, when you're kind of unhappy, you keep on doing things, and you're like, okay, what's my tolerance for unhappy? Okay. There's like a thing that I don't like, and then there's the unknown. And oftentimes we choose the thing I don't like because the unknown is just too scary. Mm. And that was the first time in my life that every time I come up against this wall of like I'm not happy, and then there's the unknown. I'm now always choose, just choosing a known. Choose now, the unknown. some people would be like, I don't want to do this. So I'm just going to go, quote unquote, enjoy my life, party, relax, whatever. But you obviously didn't because you're extremely successful. So what did you do? I worked three jobs in college. I got straight A's and I just poured myself into helping whoever I could around me. Was I it know, a process of figuring out then what you want to do or did you know? Yeah. When did the camera pickup happen? When did you actually pick up a camera? It was okay. So, so. 
every time I got stuck and I was like, I'm unhappy, I'm gonna choose the unknown. And in law school, I was just like, I'm so unhappy and I hate this here, what am I gonna do? And I just thought to myself like, if, if I had a dream, I would wanna become a photographer. So I, we get married. I want my husband, I want my husband, to, I want my mom to see me and my husband get married. So we plan a wedding in three months and it's just our families. So we get married and then he asks me, I get a letter to go back to school. I was like, I'm so sick, man. I don't wanna go back there and I hate it. And he says, if you could do one thing for the rest of your life, what would it be? And I said, I wanna be a photographer. And he's like, okay, you don't have a camera. I was like, I know, but if I did, <laughs> I think I can do this thing. And it's just like, who's crazy? The person with the crazy dreams or the person who believes the person with the crazy dreams? I think he's the crazier of the two. A couple months later, he gives me uh, Christmas, goes to Best Buy, buys a camera off the shelf. People mm. look at it like, oh, what a joke. And it probably was, but I didn't know any better. So mm. I was like, Oh, and he's like, listen, one year. We had no money. He was with this startup. I worked part-time at my dad's church. I, we, we literally had no money. So I get this camera and I think like, oh my God, this is my passport. Like I'm getting out. I don't have to go to law school and I don't have any lenses. I don't even have CF cards, like memory cards. Yeah. Can't afford that. So then I start renting. I start huh. renting cards. I start renting lenses. I was like, I'm gonna get out. And like that became my my life jacket, like my preserver. And I said, I have one year. And if this, this doesn't work, I'm gonna go back to law school. And so in that first year, I made $100,000. And the irony wow. is it was done all on rented gear, rented cameras. I didn't have a website. I didn't know which way was up. And I was not that good. Wait a minute. Hold on. You <laughs> was made this even grand? a hobby for you before this? No, I didn't, have a, I, didn't, I, didn't have, I didn't have a camera. Like legit. It just sparked in your head. Well, like, it was something, something that I was just here. like, okay. It, and here's another thing is that if we're choosing between something we like and that's something of the unknown, but there's something in you that's calling, you wouldn't be given this crazy idea. You wouldn't be, cr be given these things in your body and in your soul if you weren't actually destined to do them. And oftentimes we call them and we just say, okay, this is not the thing that I'm going to do. But I'm like, I don't wake up and be like, oh, I want to play for the WNBA. Of course not. But I wake up and I can be like, man, what would, I think I, I think I could be a photographer based on nothing. But the same way that many times people wow. like wake up and are like, man, you know what? It would be really cool. It'd be really cool to get into woodworking. It'd be really cool to cut body fat by 14%. If you weren't capable of it, you wouldn't have that idea. And I didn't, not, I didn't know that. And the more that I started honing in on that over life, the quicker I found success after a lot of failure too. So you made a hundred grand your first year. How, what were you selling? What were you doing? You had no experience with Nothing. photography. Yeah, what was the first Nothing. deal? What was the first, very first deal? First person that paid you something. Yeah, exactly. to take a for, yeah, yeah, okay, but hold on, but hold on, hold on. The, the crazy Glamour thing shots here by is, Deb, was it like that? We no, had, no. You had a little caboodle <laughs> holding on to the doors. Yeah. Like, I'll take no, it, it was worse, man. If I had <laughs> no a caboodle that was going door to door, I'd probably sell more legit. Uh, I was burning them on DVDs that I bought at Staples. I would be like, I would literally, I didn't have a website. I didn't even know how to do anything. And I was 25 years old and I didn't know a single person in my life who had a business. Like I hail from housekeepers and nannies and gardeners. So for me to think that I had the audacity to start a business is crazy. And I was like, can I just make money? It wasn't even a business. It was like, can I just make money doing something that I want? And so then um, I started a blog on Blogger back in the day. And I was like, okay, I know how to upload a photo. And I would just write, I would write about the photo, I would write about it. And I would literally, it was, man, you guys, it's so bad. I was just like, okay. So I was on the street and I asked this guy if I could take his photo. And he said, no, I just documented every, every like let down, every disappointment. And then I was like, okay, if people don't let me take their photos, we had this orange tree in our, uh, we lived in an apartment complex and this orange tree right in the middle. And I would just go and sh shoot the orange tree. I was like, okay, I'm learning this thing called backlit, side lit, exposure. And I would post these photos of this orange tree for no Nobody to read, but lo and behold, there's this thing called SEO. And so then I start taking pictures of just life. Like literally I was in LA and in little Tokyo taking pictures of some art, not very good. I would put it up a picture of my ramen. And all of a sudden I start narrating the journey of becoming a photographer and people became interested. And I just started shooting with other photographers. I would go and be like third or fourth shooter. I would be like, I would pay somebody to go and shoot a wedding with them. That's I would crazy. turn over my oh, stuff wow. to them and I'd be like, listen, I just want to be here. I just want to get my hands dirty. Shit. I'll carry bags. I'll do whatever. And um, then they would allow me to use their photos, but that would have to attribute credit. So I just started burning them on CDs from Staples and then I'll get a white ribbon. And then people would be like, can I see your portfolio? I was like, oh, unfortunately my website's under construction. Not a full <laughs> lie. Like, you know, like half <laughs> lie. It was good to get there. And so then I would just put it in a, in a, in a padded envelope, hand write their address. And I'd be like, put the CD in your computer and watch my portfolio come to life. And uh, that's why I booked my first, my first client. No they had shit. said, what's your price? And I was like, oh, you know, what are you, what are you working with? And they had said a thousand dollars, 12 hours of coverage. And they wanted all the photos. And I was like, done a thousand bucks. I can make a thousand bucks in 12 hours. 
which, you know, when we think about it, it's not that much, but I was like, hey, At that yeah. time it is. Like, I'm doing my thing. And um, that bride had 12 bridesmaids. I burned them all CDs. MySpace was just taking off. They started posting those photos. And then boom, 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 boom. People started booking me. On my blog, I was writing a story. See, shout out to that professor who said I couldn't write. I would mm. write their story. I would add a few photos. And people started being like, oh, she, she was there. Like she got whatever was going on. She got what we put down. And I saw the client for who they were. I wrote their story. I posted their photos. And then SEO started taking off. And so people, I remember the third client I've booked, she had put in uh, Korean Hollywood hairstyles. Well, I'm born and raised in LA. So we were at Yamashiro. We were uh, at dinner. I was talking about how I shot a Korean engagement session, a, a, a couple, an engagement session for a Korean couple. And they found my portfolio. And she's like, listen, I'm not getting married. My best friend is, I'm gonna send her your stuff. And so I sent them a CD and then just word of mouth. And I knew that if I put my photos with my words online, I quickly understood that people by and large make emotional decisions about intellectual opportunities. So if you're looking for something, like if I'm looking for a trainer, I'm gonna make an emotional decision. I actually don't know how good you are at what you do, but do I resonate with you? Do you get me? Do you make me a promise that I believe? There are other people, there are other trainers who are probably more talented, whatever that is in this sphere, but I'm gonna choose on emotion. And I quickly understood that if I can tap into people's emotion around an intellectual decision, I could win that game. So I was winning on the emotional game and then my skills caught up and then I was able to raise my prices. So every three weddings I booked, I raised my prices $300. So in the span of 12 months, I had booked over 50 weddings and I went from shooting weddings for $1,000 to shooting base weddings for around six grand. And then we, towards the end of my career, I was shooting weddings for 20 grand. Hey, real quick, this episode is brought to you by Legion and they have a brand new energy drink you're definitely gonna tr wanna try out. By the way, if you go through our link, you get a discount. So click on this one. Wow. So so you open this by saying, essentially, I'm going to put it in a nutshell, you're willing to do whatever it takes. I'm going to go work for free. Yes. I'm going to go uh, tell other photographers. I'll even pay you to follow you around to learn from you and meet people. I'm going to give out these burns that you paid for mm -hmm. to people so they could see what I'm doing. Oftentimes, you hear people talk about Oh, internship, how much do they pay me? Or, oh, go do that thing for free. I mean, we work with trainers all the time and coaches, and we talk about giving people your, your services for free. This is how you build your mm -hmm. business initially. And sometimes we get pushback, like, why would I do anything for free? Do you see this as being like a big mistake Huge. with people? It is like the most unleveraged, like me, a professional entrepreneur, I would go and do something for free. I have offered to another very high profile entrepreneur who had a very high profile opportunity. I said, I'll go and I'll create content for you. That is so, like, if we're just being honest, that's so far below my capacity as an entrepreneur. But if I can get into those rooms and I could see the way that those people play and I can act and behave, then game over. I will do anything to get into a different room and to be around other people because I learn how to up level. Somebody had once said, you, to change your life, you have to change your environment. But oftentimes you're kept in environments that are not open to you. So I'll do anything to get into that environment still to this day. Now, while you're doing this that first year, what's your husband thinking? Is he seeing this process? Is he like at first like, oh, cool. She's got this. She's driven. Obviously, you're already a driven person. It's like, she's driven. She likes this thing. Mm. And then you start making money. At what point was he like, uh, honey, what is going on here? Uh, when I asked him to leave his job. <laughs> <laughs> How long? Uh, just like just over a year. And I said, listen, uh, I've made enough money. And now people are flying us out from L.A. to shoot around the U.S., and later that year, we'd be flown internationally. So I said, I'm gonna have to hire somebody. So how about we just tighten our belts? If we can estimate that we're gonna do another 100,000, 150,000, we could do this. Now, here's the thing. And oftentimes people hear that and that's not an impressive amount of money, but coming from my family, my dad raised a family of seven and didn't make a hundred grand in three years. Right. So in my mind, I was like, we hide the hog. Like, yeah. what are we, like, yeah. we could do this. We get to travel, we get to be together. And so he said, yeah. I said, okay, so I'm not gonna pay somebody else. We're gonna do this together. And like, we're going all in. And literally he and I are sitting at the dining room table, like going through the manual of a camera to figure it out. And then we'd go out, we would practice, we would get paid. And we're like, it doesn't get better than this. Like we're eating Taco Bell on a Thursday night in front of a fireplace date night. Like 
we're we're living our best life. Like it did, we dreamt of moments like this, and then it happened. And then lo and behold, our portfolios expanded. I started getting awards for my work. I started teaching other photographers the business of photography. And then people are like, yeah, but how do I learn more from you? And so like late one night, I just sat up and I was like, okay, I understand this business thing. So I, I said, people are having a hard time booking their clients. They kind of go as like cold leads. And so then I wrote 20 emails at the time, but what we call today email funnels. Mm-hmm. I was doing that and I didn't know I was doing it. So I said, here's an email that you send to somebody after they inquire. Here's the 12 questions you need to ask. And so it was an email template I uploaded for like $19.99 into an online store. Again, no idea how to build an online store, something called eJunkie. I just uploaded a PDF, put it up like a buy button, and that created a six figure revenue stream based on a $19.99 PDF. So wow. you were writing copy, essentially. You wrote 20 emails. emails. Wow. Mm-hmm. At what and point is it? How old are you? How far is this? This is a year after the first? Uh, at this point, it's about two years. Two years. Two years into the game. So JD, my husband, business partner, we were working together about a year. And so at this time, we're trading hours for dollars. And I thought to myself, I'm, I'm still blogging. I'm still creating content. And people are asking questions. And so I'm sharing a bunch of free content. And I'm building trust with people. So I make an offer. The very first digital offer I ever created was 1999. And that thing just sold. It just met value and demand. And it was like lightning in a bottle. And mm. that's why I knew, oh, there's something else here. Explain what you said, trading hours for dollars. And then talk about how you move from that to the next level. Oh, so there's like a distinct differentiation of having an online business and having a business online. So when you have a business online, that means somebody can buy something from you. I could book a training session. I can send you an email. You can send me an invoice. Mm. But having an online business means that you have a secured pathway to revenue regardless of your effort. The same amount of effort can yield $100 or $100,000. That's an online business. And that became a game changer. Yeah, because a lot of people, so again, I, I come from an immigrant family and my family, very poor. And their understanding of, of, of you know creating wealth was you just make a lot per hour. And you make a lot for what you do, meaning you want to make more. At some point, you just keep working more and more. You're saying you took it from that to, no, no, I'm going to make more money with doing the same amount of work. Correct. So just create a, now you're creating this email template, these 20 emails. Mm. How do you, what's the next thing? Um, people want to see me shoot. And so I was like, okay. How, now, are they telling you this? Are you yeah. waiting for your market to tell you where to 100%. go? hundred okay. percent. I don't create anything mm-hmm. unless somebody has said it multiple times. Like the cue for me is three. And if I hear the same thing around three times, I start putting things out on social. I start asking questions in newsletters. I start saying, wait a minute, if three people say it, how can I duplicate this? So I start getting more So let's pause right there. This is really important. Adam <clears throat> talks about this all the time yeah, with, with our coaches. Huge. Is uh, oftentimes a lot of mistakes people make start because they believe they know what the market wants. Mm-hmm. So they throw out ideas, which is fine, but you're going to probably throw out a lot of failures mm-hmm. before you succeed. And you really don't ever know. Mm-hmm. You're saying, I don't do that. I wait until my people tell me what they want. Mm-hmm. And then I figure Proper out how to create there. it. Mm-hmm. Right? A hundred percent. And beyond that is when they ask, that means they're willing to pay. And if they're not asking, they're probably not willing to pay. Mm-hmm. And so what happens is like, we are very educated around what we know people need to succeed. And that's not often the thing that somebody wants to buy. And so when it's like co- chocolate covered broccoli, in order for them to eat the broccoli, it's probably, I'm actually not a good analogy for y'all. I know, like chocolate <laughs> and broccoli. I know, I know. But it's like, how do you get them ultimately? How do you how do you give them what they need and sell them what they want? And that is truly on the back of listening to what people are saying. And every time I've tried saying, "Oh, but this is what you really want," it never sells the way that the other stuff did. Yeah. And so then we kind of decided to flip the script. So we had this nineteen this. 1999 PDF and people are like, we want to see you shoot. And so then we decided, okay, well, what if we hosted a one day event? People want to see me shoot. They want to build their portfolios, $2,000. Come hang out for the day. I'll walk you through my business. I'll have a, I'll have a shoot. And then we'll see, we'll see what happens. We had 20 tickets. We sold out less than 20 minutes. Wow. And I was like, oh my God. So we decided to do that every other month. That created a different revenue stream. But then there was a ton of people who were like, $2,000 is just way out of Because they were booking so fast. So that's a market signal. It's like, I have a product and it's booked right away. Oh, yeah. Who else was doing this at the time? Because I I feel like, yeah, that was Mm -mm. probably very slim. I mean, here's the thing. So it's a very myopic view, right? So it's like, if you have something that you think is like really proprietary, you don't want to share it. So Mm -hmm. I just decided, let me flip the script Mm -hmm. and like let people in. Let me do it the opposite way because I'm only creating the thing that I wish I had and the thing that people are asking me for. 
And all of a sudden, and now that's a very duplicative model in the industry. But at the time, people weren't doing it. And people were literally like, we were selling out so fast. We had wait lists. And we're like, okay, we could start doubling down on this. And there was a whole segment of people that were left unserved. And so what happened, we were creating content around this thing. People were like, we want more, but we can't afford this. And I was like, okay, let me reverse engineer. What do they actually want? And so I started asking people, I would email them. Okay, but what is it about it? Is it the business component? No, it was never the business component. They wanted to see me shoot. And so then I hired a videographer. I said, come with me to three weddings. And I want at the end of this five minute videos just of watching me and the dynamic of shooting. And so then we had, I think we had uploaded like 12 videos and we listed them. Gosh. So a new digital program. New, not even, you guys, it wasn't even a program. It was a two ninety nine five minute video that you can download. <laughs> and we just put them up for $2.99. Wow. And we just like, just ding, 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 ding. And I was like, the there is something there. here. There yeah. is something here around building trust with people, creating free content, and then having a way for them to buy and go deeper. And that's exactly what the model that you guys had built. But yeah. this was like early on. Yeah, We're back in way like early. 2011-ish, oh, no, really you know? Early. How are you finding the leads for for all of this at this through this, through this process? How are you getting people to to talk to to do this? Or blog, to find blog, blog, blog. Blog. Yeah. blog. So at the, this whole time, you're continuing to write the blog mm -hmm. and put content. How often are you writing and putting stuff out there? Uh, seven days a week, sometimes one or two posts a day. So every day, you're still, this whole time, you're consistent putting oh, yeah. stuff out there. Oh, yeah. Okay, and people are going to wonder, wh where do you find the content for that? How do you write every single day? It's crazy. Content begets content. Because you make something, and if you make it long enough, one person will ask a question. And then all you have to do is yes. signal. So uh, I was asked today, or even better, mm. if you highlight, you know, like Stephen from Connecticut asked, and people are like, wait, we can ask him? We can ask her? And so I started shouting people out. And then if they had a blog, I would link to their blog. At the time, the blog was getting Smart. like 25, 30,000 hits a day, unique hits a day, mm. which I didn't even know meant something. But I was like, oh, people are here. And so all of a sudden people wanted to be listed and they started giving me the content that they wanted to know and see. And all of a sudden questions that I thought, oh, this is dumb or not like not interesting, that thing lit up. And the stuff that I thought was really interesting, oh, people are gonna love this. Didn't care. Didn't care. Yeah. Didn't care. How many times have we learned that oh lesson? Yeah. 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 So many times. Yeah. We've learned that lesson so yeah. many times. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this whole time Simple you're writing, ways. this whole time you're, and you're creating these digital products, things are starting to take off. At, at what point are you looking at this and looking at your husband and going, we're gonna be millionaires? Um, Probably not for a while. In fact, like earlier, before we started recording, uh, Doug and I were chatting. And I said, you know, I did this thing in 2010 called Creative Live. And there was a photographer at the time, his name was Chase Jarvis. And he had started creating online content. And people are thinking, when they hear that now, it seems so silly. But at the time, there was not a way to broadcast on the internet. There was a thing called Ustream. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And so uh, I got a phone call. I don't know this guy. He doesn't really know me. And he's like, hey, I hear you're creating waves in the wedding world. Uh, let's do something crazy. And I was like, Okay, what's crazy? He says, what if we have a real wedding and we broadcast it live on the internet? Now at this time, I have no frame of reference. I'm like, wait, 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 you're breaking my whole frame of reality. Like, what are you even talking about? <laughs> and he's like, real people, a real bride and groom with their real family members, and then people will watch it. Live. Live. And I was like, yeah. Again, get me in the room. Get me around the people who are breaking the frame of reality and get me to, because when I looked at like, he's on the cover of Newsweek, he had an app, he was an author, he was shooting all celebrities. And I'm like, I don't know how to behave. I don't know who I am. If I get into the room, I can model. Mm. Like, let me just model what that version of success looks like. Mm. And then I can embody it. And so we did that. And we quite honestly broke the internet. We were trending um, right behind President Obama and right above Lindsay Lohan mm. on Twitter. And I think wow. it was over 40 excuse me, over 400,000 people were watching live at one time That's of wild. a real couple getting married. And so I was telling Doug, I'm like, that completely shifted what I was able to do. And the online store was all these tiny little things. And on the back of that much exposure, then I was like, okay, we're playing a different game now. I was just going to ask you, how'd you leverage that, uh, that exposure? And imagine if I didn't have, if we didn't have the digital offerings, there wouldn't have been a way to scale it because the other arm of the business was trading hours for dollars. Right. Like even if everybody wanted to book a one hour call, you can't scale it. So we did have some things on queue that people can buy on demand. And then the wait list for the live events skyrocketed. And like we were having one every single month, but at the same time you realize, okay, I think it's time for an expansion. What did that look like? Um, I, okay. So then there is the thing, you know, and the thing you don't. And I was like, I think I'm being called to create for a larger audience. 
a larger TAM, total addressable market. So I had gone so deep with photographers that I realized I can take what I'm teaching to photographers and go into Other bigger markets. markets. Mm -hmm. And people thought that was crazy because they're just like, wait a minute, you literally got to the 1% of the 1% in your industry. You were literally charging what the top people charge. You were in magazines, you were writing editorials, you're making so much money from photographers. And I was like, absolutely. But there is a bigger circle here. And I want to at least try to start taking what I've learned and applying it to different industries. And that was really scary because you have to, you have to burn the boats. You have to leave the thing that brought you to that point when you're very serious. And that was like a two year iteration. And I've noticed that every time I've pivoted, it's been like a two year iteration. Tell me about the first, the next, from that, from where you were in photographer, what was the next bigger circle? What do you mean? Explain that. So uh, I was creating blog posts and I was creating content for photographers. And then other companies in the industry started saying, well, can you go and do that for us? Got it. And I was like, okay, you want me to do what I'm doing, but I get paid for it to do it on your behalf? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I started realizing, oh man, here I am. I'm trading hours for dollars. And I said, okay, at the time there was like six or seven companies that were paying me to do this. I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to focus on, on my arm of the business now that I have digital offerings. And then they had said, well, can you come in and teach our teams how to build a brand and market it on social media? Mm. And I had never heard of the word consulting. They're like, do you do consulting? And I was like, well, how much do you charge? Or like, how mm. much do you have? And then I saw that you could be a consultant, which means that you just tell people the work to do and then they go and do it. I was like, Phew, I could do this. <laughs> so we started <laughs> consulting and then I started realizing, okay, there's some teams who deploy, there's some teams who don't. And as a consultant, you go in and then you're valued on the veracity of the team. And I was like, I don't like to be judged on somebody else's work because that, that was a non-controllable. And I was like, this is no longer suiting me. And it was at that point in time where we went from doing the work to consulting about the work where I moved into a larger TAM. And I said, I'm going to create a digital course. I had this idea. Okay, this is stupid. It, it was actually stupid. It was very stupid. I hate talking about myself that way, but it, it really was. I was just woke up and I was like, I'm going to create a class on how to build a brand and, and, and market on social media for business owners, period. And punto, this is it. I'm going <laughs> to rent out a studio in LA. And I, I just did it so wrong, you guys. I hired like eight videographers. We had a producer. I mean, we had a live audience. I charged a thousand dollars a ticket for this one day thing. And when I got the bill back from like the video team, I was like, oh, <gasps> my God, I think they charge like 80 grand for this event. And I was like, what am I going to do? I have hours and hours of content. And I was like, what am I going to do? I'd never even heard of a course. So I just start Googling. How do I sell? How do I sell long form content? And then I came across something that said there was like a mastermind. I didn't even know what a mastermind was. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to see what this thing, thing is. This guy has this online class. He called it a webinar. I was like, what's a webinar? And he says, uh, join, my, join my group of people. And I'm watching this with my husband. We're making dinner and I was like, man, I think this is expensive. Like, I think he's going to charge a lot of money. I was like, this guy is going to charge like $5,000. My husband's like, he's going to charge 10. We're sitting there. He gets to the end of the pitch and he's like, so for $25,000. I was like, oh my <laughs> God, I shut the computer. I was like, this fool. You need someone to buy his like snake oil. I'm smarter than that. Uh -huh. Next day, he says, in order to apply, you have to put down $1,000. Put down $1,000. And I was like, I don't know that world, but what did I need to do? I needed to get into the room. I needed to act and behave the way online business owners did. And that changed my life because in that time that I was there, I had literally hours and hours of content. I had to figure out how to make this course. And he's like, hey, how can you just test this new audience? How deep is your personal brand? Because with photographers, they're going to buy your stuff. But how deep is your, is your brand with non-photographers, with just business owners? I said, I don't know. And he says, can you just do a cheap offer? Just kind of test the water. And I was like, I don't know. He's like, give yourself two months. Make this offer. Put it out. Beta test it. In four months, launch it. I did. Made $255,000 in five days. I was like, oh, oh. we're going to be millionaires. What was the product? It was $197 program for- Oh, it was only 197 too. 197. That's a lot of volume then. Yeah, we did volume. Wow. We did volume. And what, it was, was it, what was it? Instagram for business. I said, if you want to use Instagram for your business, buy this course. And and that was your first test. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you're like, okay, this is there's something here. Absolutely. And I'm going to continue to make products and services for people who want to build their business mm -hmm. through social media. What year was this? That was 2015. Wow. And that's mm -hmm. like such a thing now. Like everybody's like, oh, you mm -hmm. can build your business through social media, but you were just mm -hmm. starting this. Were you, did you, at, at that, at any point when you were doing this, were you like, oh, we're kind of trailblazing a little bit? No. You, I, I, maybe some people do. Maybe people with chutzpah, cajones, not me. I was like, this is a mess. This is going to fail. What the heck are we doing? We're doing it wrong. Why are we up at midnight trying to figure out what a lead page is to mm -hmm. our email software system? Like you, it feels so messy. Brene Brown says it best. She says it's gold plated grit. We look at something that we did that was like really hard 
in the past, we're like, oh yeah, we did that thing and it was great and easy. But what people don't see in the middle of it, which is what I was documenting on my blog, I was just like, I think I'm underwater. We had just bought a house. Our construction was so much more than we had anticipated. I'm $80,000 already paid for this videographer, not even including the edits or the uploads or anything along that. I was like, I don't know how we're gonna, like, how are we gonna get out of this? I think that there's something really compelling about somebody just speaking their truth mm -hmm. and then seeing that climb up and bringing, it, bringing them with it. So what are some of the big mistakes that people make trying to build their businesses through social media? And what are some of the best ways that they could move forward? I mean, obviously, you know what you're doing. So what do people screw up? Because everybody wants now everybody's like, I want to build my business, I got to use social media. But not everybody can do it. I think the first mistake is people think, well, if I had more followers, then I would have more customers. Okay. And the fact is, if you have 100 followers now and you don't have customers, having 1,000 followers doesn't, doesn't mean matter. you're going to get a customer. Like you're, the way that you're presenting your business isn't working for the small segment. Volume doesn't fix it. Volume only enhances, but also volume exposes. If you don't have people now, you're not gonna have if you have more. So thing number one is don't focus on what you want, focus on who you have and then figure out what they want or what they need. What are people asking about? And people are like, oh, well, nobody's leaving me comments or nobody's leaving me DMs. That leads to point two. Well, how consistent are you? Mm -hmm. Like consistency is the thing. They have to know and trust that you only don't show up. It's like you're silent for three weeks and all of a sudden you're like, oh, my program. You're like, oh, lose your 50 pounds at the beginning of the year. And when you haven't posted anything since mm -hmm. the previous Halloween, when you were able to walk around without a shirt, everyone <laughs> thinks that you're just there to sell them something yeah. and they smell that. And so in order for you to move past that, trust is the currency on social media. And then the third part would be, like, what's your plan? Like nobody says, oh, I'm going to get healthy or I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to work out. And then you don't have a plan. It's like your success is directly correlated to what your plan is. Yeah, uh, we learned the whole follower thing that you said early on. I remember Adam had found someone on social media that had, she had what was she, had like 3 million followers? Yeah. And we had her post about uh, Mind Pump, and we're like, oh, we're gonna get this new flood of mm -hmm. listeners. Nothing, yeah. Yeah. zero, we got zero, we didn't feel yeah. it at all. That was our first lesson in like, oh, followers don't necessarily mean mm -hmm. influence necessarily. Mm -hmm. Jazz, I, I want you to talk a little bit about um, your your work ethic around learning and leveling up, like something that we kind of glossed over, the fact that you were able to get into USA tells me a lot about uh, the behaviors that you built around being a student and a student of the game, learning. Like I also know personally, like how much you invest in masterminds and groups and getting in the room. Like during even that process of like the photography, like how how much time are you also spending in like reading, learning, getting in rooms? Like how, what is that? Because obviously you were consistent with the posting. That's a big part, mm -hmm. but you obviously leveled up too. And I know that is partially through the practice and doing it, but I'm assuming you probably were doing more outside of that too. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now if you want it. Click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. If we can back up a, t a tiny bit, because I feel like this story encapsulates every story, because I think it's hard when somebody looks at somebody who's successful and be like, okay, well, that's for them. That worked at that time for that person in that way. But I think if we were to peel it back and all things being equal, I got straight A's in high school, not because I was the smartest or the wittiest. I just, I worked really hard. I got straight A's in college, not because I was really smart. I just worked really hard. I was literally the last person standing when it came down time to meet with a professor to study p principles of marketing. I got an A not because I was the smartest. I got an A because I was the last person to leave that room and I knew every question that was gonna be on that test. Six hours later, not everybody's willing to do those types of things. And so I knew that I, I knew and I know I don't test well. I didn't learn how to read till I was 11. I'm not necessarily like IQ smart whatsoever. I'm just, I, I'm driven. And I think that that's like a story that people can look into because if I was smart, people would say, oh, well, it's because she's like that. But I'm like, no, no, no. I just have, I don't know, the stupidity, the chutzpah and the courage to stay as long as it takes to get to where I want to go. And so I knew that when I was going into my LSAT, I, I went through two courses. I paid for all of that. I did the things that you're supposed to do. And I was testing like dumb as a doorknob. I was like, okay, I'm going to take this LSAT. I'm probably gonna do poorly, just factually. And guess what, I was right. I did not do well. For all intents and purposes, I shouldn't even got into a tier three law school. So then I started calling admissions offices. Nobody answered. I started emailing. I'll just go to an admissions page and be like, who do I email? I started emailing people. And I said, can I talk to somebody about what it would take for somebody who's not qualified on a test taker to go through and get in? I got like, I got like 999 no's. And this one brother from UCLA says, what are you looking for? And so then 
I was, can I call you? I pick up the phone and I said, this is it. This is the truth of it. I know I'll kill it. I'm just get, like, I just need to get in. And he's like, you need to create a case for why you belong in law school. You want to be a lawyer, create a case. I took that like freaking Bible. And I was mm -hmm. like, I need to create a case. So all of my admissions were just like in the past. I didn't learn how to read till I was 11. I was homeschooled. I didn't have very much money. When I started reading, I, I was reading War and Peace when I was 13. So I just know that if I have the opportunity, so I laid out the case. And I think that that's when we talk about every room that you get in there after it's what do I need to do? Or who do I need to become in order for me to get into the room? And so progressively, I've been able to get into bigger rooms and better rooms because I have more money to spend. But this goes back to how much are you willing to reinvest in yourself? Even if all things considered, not exactly eligible to be in there. Yeah. How, think, how important is that for success? Do you think? <clears throat> I, from my opinion, from my opinion, having the ability and accessibility is the game changer. I don't know it from anybody else's perspective. I only know it from myself, a first generation Latina, a, a female, a first time founder. The fact, I mean, what a beautiful country. You get to say, I want something. How do I get it? You're not guaranteed to get it. You can reverse engineer and you take tiny little steps to get there. And so I think that is to me, the greatest gift and how you, jump over other people is by paying to invest in yourself. Because my dad always said, a country can take away your car, your home, your zip code. They can't take away your knowledge. And that's why he was a huge defender, like learn. They can't take that away. And now I've just applied that to my business and it's always 10X paid back. Do you think, uh, do you think immigrants have an advantage or children from immigrants have an advantage because they see the, I don't mean advantage in terms of like, obviously they're not as privileged, but the work ethic oftentimes you hear comes from children of immigrants. Did you get that from your parents? Did oh, you see that? Okay. hundred percent. My dad was like the hardest working person I knew, but still it was very hard. We, I yeah. saw my father lose two homes, not because of lack of diligence, but there was just, there was just no money. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of floated around from apartment to apartment. And I think that just working for everything you have and watching how he showed up for his family and then being so happy with whatever little there was like really set the precedent for how much, it's the game. I don't, I, I want the money, but you're not in the game for the money. And I think that that kind of has like a different perspective. I think there's something else too, that I'm picking up from your story uh, that, you know, really helped to, to catapult your success in terms of you being so transparent in your process and documenting that and uh, being, allowing people in to that process. And I think that that's a very rare thing, especially that early. Uh, a lot of people now are trying to kind of do that and mm -hmm. show that on social media. But uh, talk to me about that in terms of like the fear of letting somebody in to your process when you don't even really think you know what you're doing. You know, um, the greatest gift that you can give yourself is the ability to trust that people are going to have an opinion either way. They're gonna have an opinion if you sit on the couch or if you go to the gym. They're gonna have an opinion if you eat a pizza or you have a smoothie. They're gonna have an opinion if you run the marathon or not. And so if you know that people are gonna have an opinion if you decide to pursue something, then let it be. Let them have an opinion. They are gonna have an opinion if you're living your best or if you're absolutely living your worst. And I just kind of feel like to myself, if you don't like me, I want you to be real sure. I don't need you to be lukewarm about me. I need you to say that you saw what I did or you heard me speak and it's like, I don't like her. Great. I don't need to be for you. I need you to trust that what I'm saying is 100% my truth. I would rather be 100% of myself and somebody say, that's not for me. Cool. Mm. I wasn't intended to be. I think that if we go in and we understand that the future, not just of business, but of life, but specifically want to be strategic about business is from now on, it will only be niche centric, content centric around something that somebody wants to go deep with. Gone are the days of Oprah. Gone are the days of Paris Hilton. Gone are the days of Mr. Beast. Gone are the days of Kim mm. Kardashian. As our attention gets more and more segmented, the way that people rise to the top is becoming so super specialized on what it is they're talking about and creating content around that one thing. You will never, ever, ever be all the things to all the people because Oprah descended because it was a vehicle for a lot of women watching a show at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Yeah. But what were yeah. the other options? Not very much at that time. And so Kim Kardashian came in at a time where it's like she was getting an attention in one or two social platforms, became famous for one or two things and then became famous for being famous. But what we see is like Mr. Beast, not as much as Kardashian, but went real big on one outlet doing, trying to master that outlet. And what do we see from there? You're going to have to start doing different things specific to a topic on a platform in order to have relevance within that group. So, so the name of the game, and this largely has to do with just accessibility. There's so many channels, so many outlets, so many different people that, um, 
specializing is the name of the game now. Mm-hmm. Getting Absolutely. real specific and real Absolutely. specialized in, in what you do. Do you have any examples of that? Well, I mean, when I look at what, the stuff that you guys are doing, okay. you know, it's like you guys are going after a very um, diverse group of people, but you're serving them in very specific ways. I mm-hmm. think that's the only way that you're going to be able to to leverage that beyond that. So it's like, I may not to brag, but this morning I did mommy maps. I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to brag. I'm not going to brag. Uh, but like when you build stuff out like that, that speaks to where that person's are, where that person is on their journey, mm-hmm. it makes them feel like it's resonant with them. They're going to spend more time. They're going to spend more money and they're going to have a lot more allegiance to it. Mm. How do you balance? You are a mom, right? I am. How do you balance being a mother with with what you're doing? I have a really great partner. I feel like, you know, I, I've really taken a big step back. I don't really talk so much about it. Not because I don't love it. Not because I think I, I don't. I I know I have the best kid in the world. I know. I know. I know. Everything's that. <laughs> She's just perfect for me. And so I, I understand that a lot of times, like as a woman and as an entrepreneur, people say, well, how are you doing it? And I'm like, I'm not the person that you want to be talking to because I'm an entrepreneur who's a mom. I'm not a mom who's an entrepreneur. Mm. And I'm very open with my partner. And we have like, what, what? it doesn't have to look good for anybody else. It doesn't have to be great. It doesn't have to be proved. What works for us? And we are 50-50 partners and parents. But during the workday, he is taking the lead as the parent during that time. And so here I am, I flew up today, I'll flow back home. He dropped me off at the airport with her. He will pick me up at the airport with her and he's on dad mode. I like how you're not apologetic about it. I feel like moms in particular um, can sometimes struggle with that, right? Yeah, like absolutely. because of either expectations or whatever, it's like, uh, I don't know, I, you know, and men don't necessarily feel this pressure. Um, so I like that you're super transparent about that and just very open about it and kind of like, this is how I am and this is uh, what I like to do. Where did you get that from? You don't often hear that from people that kind of like, like earlier you said, you know, if, you, you li- if you're not going to be lukewarm, you're going to love me or hate me, but I'm going to mm-hmm. make sure it's one or the other. Mm-hmm. Where did you get that from? Did you inherit that or were you born with that? No, I think that um, I was recently watching a documentary about Martha Stewart and she said that she had to go to prison in order to be free. And I thought that was so powerful because oftentimes we live in the cages that we construct ourselves. And I feel like for so long, I was so afraid of the peop- of the opinions that people had had about me. And there was a time in my photography career where I just got ripped apart. There's a group of people who just decided just to go after everything about me, my content and all the things. Was this when you started taking off yeah. and other photographers were like, you're not yeah. experienced, you don't have education oh, yeah. in this. And it was like this kind of like slow burn and then there was like this pinnacle and it just like hit me like a freight truck. How were they coming after you? Was this on social media posts On stuff? social media posts. This is like, you know, when it was like Facebook groups and then people were coming to the blog and then just leaving all these like terrible comments and they'd go to oh. my Facebook page and leave terrible comments. And so you think that something like that is going to be the end of you. And you think that that will ruin you? And Did you it feel are, like that? Oh, it felt. Oh, I thought it was that. I was like, I, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I, I literally thought that my clients were going to ask for money back. It was, it was bad. The way that people were showing up, and you couldn't stop it. It was just a machine. Did and it you was a feel wave. like at any point, uh, like, okay, I, I quit. I, I don't. I oh want yeah. Anymore. I absolutely. I mean, just the nature of my business is that people were booking me so far in advance that had I not had all of like a book of business to fulfill on, I would have been like. I'm out. I'm out. I thought I was ruined. It was like my, my first stepping into therapy. And I was just like, what's wrong with me that I care about like Jerry Pence 246 and his opinion about my business? <laughs> Why do I care? Why it is affecting me? I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. I was losing my hair. I was sad. I was like, my whole life I never had anything to lose. And we'd built a business and I felt I and now it was gonna get taken to away lose. by haters. Yeah. How did you okay talk about that? Because uh, it, it's important to, dis- to to explain or talk about these kinds of challenges because now we're hearing, we see your success, we heard about all your successes, and I don't, I think sometimes on the outside people are like, oh well, okay, well did she really go through crazy struggles? So you're saying you were depressed, you, you couldn't sleep, you lost your hair. How long was that period, and how did you how did you manage yourself? What did you do to get through that? Well, a big advocate, I'm still in therapy now. Like think of it's the best thing. And and I don't know, it's it's hard to talk about a little bit in Latino culture. I can only speak for my family. My, it's not ever something that people are like, oh, therapy. No, yes. no, no. Like, you know, it's yeah, like therapy like is like a, yeah. a chunk on the back of your head and be like, toughen up, let's yeah. go. Yeah. You know, and so, exactly, exactly, exactly. And so it's like um, my husband and I had moved to Newport Beach. And so that's around the time that I started therapy. And 
kind of family joke. You know, Mexicans like re really mean to each other sometimes. They're like, oh, she's rich now. She goes to therapy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, um, but a lot of it, a lot of it was just like a reconciling of like, who am I and what do I want? And then you have to be very aware that the only person who stops you is you. Yeah. The only person who's going to stop you from taking business or building is you. And I thought to myself, well, I don't want to be the reason I stopped doing this. So then I had to make the reason and give myself reasons to continue showing up despite how awful it felt. I, uh, I think um, therapy used, I mean, obviously used properly. I mean, it's like coaching. Like yes. why wouldn't you hire somebody yes. to help you yes. work through some... How long was that period, that challenging period where people were coming after you and you were like struggling? Was that like two months, a month? Was I think it, it was about, um, like, it was pretty hard, hardcore for about six months. Oh, Yeah, it was brutal. unrelenting. It was unrelenting. I was like humiliated. When was the turning point uh, where you were like, okay, I, I'm going to get out of this? Because I'm sure, I'm sure th throughout that period, you were like barely feeling like you were trading water. You know, I think it's kind of, it's like the weirdest thing. If you woke up every day and you came into the office and Adam punched you in the face. Yeah. <laughs> I think that you kind of almost become anesthetized. Like, you know, what's coming and you're like, I so didn't die the it, day like, before. All right, here we go. How good yeah. that analogy is though, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Apropos, every morning is how it happens. <laughs> yeah, every time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so a, a little bit of like, oh, I survived. So I applied the same methodology. You just got tougher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got, what was the, what was the, the actual turning point? Like, do you remember, was there a moment where you were like, okay. Well, like, so what happens is like it, the, the vitriol got so bad that I was speaking a lot on uh, photography conferences and stages and I got pulled from all of it. They're like, we just don't want any of this negativity. Really? What I were had they saying the about you? Everything, literally um, that I was, I faked the story about my mom having cancer, that how oh my, my family God. should go back to Mexico, oh, how oh, statistically Puerto Ricans are Lord. pregnant by the time they're 18. Oh, like it was God. like, it was just, it was just. I mean, it was everything though. It was everything across the board. It's like how it was like, they they said like, I looked what like a man, the, what, everything. What were everything. the most hurtful ones to you? Uh, I would imagine it was ones that, that actually attacked your your talent because that's your work. Because this stuff is stupid. Like, oh, she, you know, like, like whatever, that's not true. Like what was the stuff that, that hurt you the most during that period of time? Um, I think, I mean, all of it, like okay. all of it. it. It's like when they, when they attack your appearance, both for and against, like, oh, the, the reason why she's able to book clients is because she wears skirts when she shoots. It's like, oh, you know, it's like stupid, stupid stuff. Yeah. Then all of a sudden it eats at you and you're like, oh, I, I was wearing a skirt. Was, was that inappropriate? Like stupid stuff mm -hmm. that never even crossed your mind. And then that's all of the stuff that you think about. And you're like, okay, I can dwell in this space and I can listen to what other people are saying, mm -hmm. or I could simply decide I'm going to move on. And very similar to being the last person with my marketing professor after six hours. Mm -hmm. And he openly said, I'm gonna tell everybody the questions that are gonna be in here. I'm literally writing the test. So I sat down at the time, there was 30 people in the class, 13 people showed up. After hour one, people left. After hour two, people left. After hour three, and I said, I'm not leaving until I know every question. Mm. And I, I think I just applied the same thing. I am not leaving this industry. I am not gonna stop taking clients. And for every stage that said, I am not allowed to go back. When you come back and ask me, and they have, I'm never going back. I do not forget the people who did not stand with me when you knew the truth, when I called you and I laid everything out and you didn't stand with me. Have you had any of that forget. satisfaction? Has anybody called you back? You're like, hey, of remember? Course. <laughs> of course, of course they call back. And you think that the satisfaction is gonna taste like nectar and ambrosia and it tastes like cardboard. Mm. And the vitriol that I was carrying around, oh, being like, yeah. one day, one day, and then the day happens, and you're like, Wah. what a lesson! You're like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> right, right? Did you forgive them? Did I forgive them? Mm. Did they need forgiveness for watching their own? I understand mm. why they made those decisions. Mm -hmm. They had a conference to run. They had sponsors to fulfill. They didn't want drama. They didn't want bad press. They watched their own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They watched their own. If they had given me an opportunity, I would have done right by them. Mm -hmm. I'm sad that they didn't do that. I don't think that there was something to be forgiven because I understood why they did it. But I now have learned in that situation, when you see somebody down and that person comes to you and says the truth of it, make a decision that's going to be the best for you and them, not on the worry or the back of bad press. Do you coach people? Because you wouldn't have gotten all that heat had you not become successful. Right. Nobody would have noticed. Right. Do you coach, do you ever coach people like that? Like, hey, by the way, if you start to crush, this may actually happen. Oh, all the time. And expect, okay. I mean, it's, it's not even coaching as much as it is. I just talk about all of my content. Like there was this, there was this bit by a, uh, a comedian, Cat Williams, 
Yeah. And he's just talking about like, if you don't have a hater today, yeah. you're not, you're not, you're doing not, it. you're not doing it. Yeah. You ain't doing shit. Like my yeah. goal is to get one more hater. Yeah. And I cannot tell you when I had looked at that, it was after everything had went down and I'd kind of done like, I'm, I'm better. I'm well, like I'm, I'm my health, most healed version of myself. And then I saw Kat Williams. I was like, that's right. When you talk about me, <laughs> spell my name, right? Give me a link. Bring it, yeah. bring it. Because, because those people tried tearing the business down. And that year we were tenfold more successful than we had been on the year that we did creative life. Wait a minute, that same year that you're getting all that yes. bad, whatever? Yes, because they came out with a whole concerted effort of how they were gonna take me down. But what they ended up doing was creating a Blow whole silo of information pointing to me being, she's terrible, she's this, she's that. And all of a sudden people who had no idea who <laughs> I was were going to my site and then having an opinion about me on their no own. No way. Right. They, on found, their they found own. the truth When, when yep. did you realize that this that was happening? Because I'm sure at first you're like, this is gonna crush my business. And they're like, wait a minute, honey. Well, then we started to say things and then, but I was paranoid. I was paranoid because I'm like, they're going to go through the videos and they're going to go through my PDFs and then they're going to rip them off and they're going to sell them to other people. They're going to say several things. They're going to misconstrue my words. They're going to, I had literally thought they were going to clip out words from one PDF, create another PDF and then have me akin to like this terror. Do we, can we say Hitler on the show? Yes, like they, were, they were making me, they were, they were drawing comparisons between me and Hitler. It was wow. really, what is really, wrong with people? you guys, I'm telling the you, the photography I'm was crazy. You, <laughs> you guys, so I, we, we sit there and we think, oh, well, like that's so silly but when you are in the middle of it even when we oh, were yeah. making those transactions yeah. on the back of it i was just like no something's not right something's not right here any strains on your marriage during this whole process or did it just make you guys stronger it made us so much stronger okay. and i think very distinctly in a way so my husband and i met when we were in high school and he's just the the kindest good mature level-headed person and that man was just stalwart he was mm. just like you know who you are don't let them buckle. Mm. He's like, you can quit. You're not quitting this year. You're not gonna let them take you down. And I needed, I really needed, I'm a tough, like I'm, I'm a baddie, but I needed somebody, I need. I was crumbling. Yeah. I needed to be soft. I needed, so you know, we, we had to have like a clear distinction between are we having a business partner conversation or are we having a husband and wife conversation? Mm. And that whole year I was like, I can't even function as a business partner or even as a partner. So he just, he held it down. Wow. Mm. And then you started crushing and then you're like, cool. <laughs> That's why, yeah, it was, I was always, it was like this expedition. Like, so sometimes, so sometimes we talk about the unknown yeah. and the thing that you're not happy with. Uh, if you don't make a move, the move will happen to you. I thank God for that experience because I probably would have stayed in that industry longer than I had been. Mm. I felt like I was like, I have everything underneath me now and I'm going, I'm going. But during that time, I had made the decision to leave the industry and I was still in the industry another two years. So behind the scenes, making moves, stack cash, got to move things differently. Where like, I'm no longer speaking on those stages, I'm gonna go speak on these stages. I'm gonna start making content in this way and just kind of like parlaying. So those two tectonic shifts caused the earthquake and I'm like, I'm on new land, I'm out. Mm. So you open with a pretty provocative statement that you're from a bunch of quitters and that you quit an industry. And now you're talking about this one as, uh, you know, I was hell bent on this industry and I'm going to stick here. And what's the difference between the two for you? Um, it's harder with the more success that you have. It's easy to quit when you have nothing to lose. Plus you were qu you're quitting on your terms, not theirs. Like quitting because everybody else is telling you to quit. Well, I, it kind of feels like, I don't know. You, I, I've just met you. You know, I know, I know you from Adam. But you seem like the kind of person that if someone tells you you're going to quit, they're like, no. Oh, yeah, no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You don't tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. I pegged it right there. I, so, uh, the, uh, so the audience knows. You and I go back over two years now. We've been in mm -hmm. the Hampton group, so we've got to know each other. One of my, I love talking uh, off-air business with you. Um, you, like me, I think, love the game of business. What is your favorite part about that? Like, what is your favorite part? I know you love the game of business. Like, what do you enjoy the most of it? Um, I, I read this quote and it said, um, the purpose of life is to determine why you're here. And the work of life is to hone your purpose. And the reason you are here is to give the gift away. Hmm. And it's, that's the quote more or less in it. And I think that what I actually really, really, really love is sharing the messy parts in the middle and then being able just to clock the documentation and being able to say, I showed up in the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I know that you have to show up in the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so when we reach those pinnacles and those apexes, we can look back 
and be really proud of those decisions. And so as much and difficult as creating content is, I think Adam and I have both said, we cannot wait to throw our phones away. Yeah. We can't yes. wait to submerge, Amen. you know, podcast mics and phones and laptops. We can't wait for that day. Even though we know that that thing has given us a passport into a new galaxy, deep appreciation. Mm. I can't wait for that day for me not to have to do that anymore. It is a privilege. Mm. I look forward to forfeiting the privilege. <laughs> Until that day comes, I love freaking sharing what it takes and on the back end and how ugly and hard it is. Because I think what happens is social media has glamorized what it means to be an entrepreneur. And I'm like, what kind of businesses are you running <laughs> that everybody's just like on the Amalfi Coast? Like, what? what? And so I think I like the documentation of the process. I like the game. I like showing the ins and outs. And I like giving people access to, to rooms, which is why when we go to these Hampton retreats, I create content. Because I think that for perhaps people of color, perhaps women, perhaps first-time founders, perhaps people not in the tech space or with large personal brands, they want to know what it is to be there. And so what a gift for me to be able to create that. Yeah, talk yeah. a little bit about um, not just Hampton, because you've done a lot of mastermind groups and to pay to get in the room. And you've changed my mind a little bit about that. Like uh, for the, my audience knows that like I, I came out talking a lot of shit about masterminds for a very long time, yet I fell in love with the group that we have yeah. and have can, renewed and we're staying together yes. and we continue to. Um, and you have a different perspective on it. So I like hearing that. So share with the audience, like, cause there is a lot of mastermind scams. It seems like that's one of the biggest hustles on the internet right mm -hmm. now is prove that I can kind of do my craft. As soon as I can prove a little bit, I get a little bit of attention that, I, and then now I'm going to sell everybody else on this because I consider myself a master. Like, how do you, how do you parse through all of that and, and hone in on the ones that you want? And what is your experience? Have they been all good? Have you had some that like, Oh, that was a waste of fucking money or have they all been a home run for you? Um, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll say, I'll say this as, as a major caveat. You put me in any room and I'm hardwired to find the win. I'm just hardwired to find the win. Mm. Cause so when my mom got sick and like, you realize how quick life goes and you, and you realize that time is not guaranteed. And so whatever time you have, my barometer of it is so distinguishedly different which is why like I, today I thought I was late when I had showed up and I was like, no, my God, cause time is your most valuable thing. If I don't respect that, that is like such a hit because we only have a few minutes every day that actually matter. And so in my mind, whatever I invest in or wherever I go, even if I don't like it, or I, even if I feel like, oh, I could be doing something else. I'm like, you're here now, mm. you better find the win. You better make this a win. And so have I had some experiences that were easier to find wins? Yes, absolutely. But for us, the way that we operate is we are going to go out of our way to find people that we connect with to create wins. And so the more investments that I've made, the more I feel inclined that I'm gonna have to make it a win. So I recently made an investment, it was really large. And I was like, this is freaking crazy. But I was doing it for proximity. And then when I kind of felt like, oh, maybe it's not as aligned, then I started looking around I'm like, I'm just gonna set up a call on my own with you. And I'm gonna ask this person to make me this intro. And I was like, how do I now reverse engineer? How do I get an ROI on this? I'm yeah. so glad you said that because I think that's the part that you really changed my mind is because I think I did view that the wrong way. I looked at it as like, okay, what is the material this person's going to bring? Does it align with what I'm trying to do? And is it is it something I don't know? Versus what I know about myself is the same thing is that you put me in a room with enough people that mm -hmm. are doing things that I'm not doing or have done something that I have done, I will find out. Yeah. And like that in itself is so powerful. And so it has reframed or reshaped the way I look at some of those groups. And maybe that's why there's such a, a clear divide of people that hate them and talk so much shit is because if you, if you pay that big ticket to get in that room and you expect it to just give no, to you exactly. your ROI, yeah, no. uh, uh, maybe you get lucky and you hit a good one, but probably not no. versus I know that I'm going to be in a room of other people that can afford to be in this room, but exactly. that alone exactly. already, exactly. you know, filters a lot of people out that I could probably learn from. Even if the main person running it doesn't have what I need to offer, I'm going to find that yes, shit in this amen. group, which is how I felt that Hampton has paid out for me. It's like, you know what? It's less, I've told you already, I don't use the actual group at all, <laughs> but the relationships yes. that I've built from it, I would pay five times that amount yeah. for. So. And I'm like a little bit, I'm a little bit sharp edged. So the guys after year one were, were having considerations, do we sign up again to be in the same group? And 
I am a I, diehard loyalist. Like, die, I mean, even if you don't want me to be loyal to you, I'm just going to be loyal to you. I, I'm loyal to gas stations because I have their card. I'm loyal to <laughs> gar- grocery stores. You know, it's like stupid. But these guys, some of them were saying, oh, well, I think I want to be in a group with other people who have businesses that are similar to mine in similar industries. And I'm like, why? <laughs> why does everybody want to sit around and talking about like what it is you're doing so that you keep your current frame of reality? I was like, the reason is get in front of other people who are doing things in different industries that are so different from you. And then you say that could not possibly ever work in my industry. And then you have like a small test to see if it can. It's supposed to break your frame of reality. That is how you leapfrog over your competition because mm-hmm. you're not doing anything the way that the industry is currently doing it. It's Cyber Monday, the Cyber Monday sale. It's happening right now. All MAPS workout programs and all MAPS workout program bundles are 60% off. Go check them out. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code CYBERMONDAY for that discount. All right, back to the show. You know, you said something interesting Mm -hmm. too because we've had the opportunity and the privilege uh, and the blessing of meeting a lot of really successful people. And there seems to be this common thread and you kind of said it where, you know, he said, are there any masterminds that you were in that sucked? And you're basically like, well, I always find a win in mm-hmm. each one. So you've got this attitude that's like, a lot of people say this is a negative. I'm going to find the positive. Um, Adam oftentimes talks about his upbringing, how challenging it was. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I don't, I think it was an advantage. It mm-hmm. made me who I am. You brought up being a woman, uh, you know, being a child of an immigrant. Do you look at those? A lot of what people will say, oh, you know, disadvantage or whatever. Do you look at those and go, no, there's advantages to them. Or these are things I'm going to use, or this is going to make, this is going to give me an edge. Mm-hmm. Do you look at things that way? The frame at which we view a situation is the truth. Mm. If I say it's been powerful to be a brown female entrepreneur, that's true. Mm. If I say it was a disadvantage, that is also true. I simply choose to pick a frame in which I want to view the world and then I make it true. But I am not special. This is what we all should be doing. We look at a situation as facts. And so people will say that I am powerless because a person, a thing, or a situation has rendered me voiceless, moneyless, penniless. And at the same time, the things that keep us powerless are the things that could actually make us powerful if we simply choose to decide, despite the facts, I will find a new system to believe. The facts can be, the, the facts could be, yes, you're poor. Yes, you were abused. Yes, you lost your job. Yes, she left you. Those are the facts. But what do you want to believe about those facts? that you are a loser, that you'll never come up. If you want to believe that, go right ahead. Or do you want to say is what will find me, will find me. And what is better will come. And I will get better along the way. You choose. This morning, I had a conversation with my sister. She had texted me and she's like, what's that thing that you said about hard conversations? Because I need to have a hard conversation. I said, nah, you need to have a conversation. If you want to call it a hard one, go right ahead. (laughs) You want to call it a healthy one, a productive one, go right ahead. Whatever label you want to apply, That's your decision. It is just a conversation. Yeah. Framework. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mental framework. Excellent. How is, uh, how is the game, uh, changing for you now? I feel like, um, you know, when you reach a certain level of success, at least is how it's been for me. Um, you know, you spend so much time trying to get to that kind of destination or reach that level. And then it kind of arrives for you. Uh, does the goalpost just keep moving for you? Have you reframed what the next five or 10 look like? Like, how is the game kind of changing for you where you're currently at right now? Oh, Adam, I was hoping you would not ask. Uh, I was like, dang you knew it. I was going so to. I had this conversation with Jiddy. I was like, man, I'm like, you know, there's this way. There's this thing Adam's or this way. This. The more, like, the more attention or the more people, like, look at you a certain way, there's this um, knee jerk reaction to protect it. And so what I had explained in the photography world, it was like a two year kind of genesis where I had made a decision that that time had come and then two years making moves behind the scenes. And what I think has been our time that Adam has known me has been like a kind of like an inflection point where I know I'm choosing the unknown and I know that behind the scenes we're making moves. And it's kind of like that awkward like I'm in puberty of mm-hmm. business and being like, oh, people have to see my oily hair and my acne as I'm doing this thing behind the scenes. And it's like, when you make a decision to shift from people's perceptions, it's like, oh, she's really good go-to-market strategist. She's really good at social media. She's really good at business building. Yes. But what people don't know behind the scenes is I'm also serving in as advisor and we have a holding company and we're investing. And so what happens is I don't want to put the cart before the horse and say, oh, like, yeah, like I got it together. I literally don't. It still feels like when those early days are like, oh, did you know what you're doing? How how did it feel? I'm like, it felt like a freaking mess. I will tell you right now that people will say, well, she's never been more successful. I'm like, it feels like a freaking mess. And I feel like 
for the first time, it feels really good to come in and say, I know where I'm going and I've seen it. Right now, it feels like a freaking mess. And I actually can't even describe what it is that I'm doing. In the business world, there's ways to describe it. And I don't know how to describe those ways. But I also know that when I wrote that 20 email PDF, that that was an email funnel. I didn't know that then. There's something in me that I'm doing that I know I'm going to look back and be like, damn girl, you didn't know what you were doing and you were doing it. And it goes back to this thing. I wouldn't have this calling to be an advisor and have a holding company. Side note, I I was like, there's this thing, Jay. I was like, there's this thing. I'm like, I, I think I want to build like this octopus. It's like, you know, the like head and it has like these different arms. And two months later, I'm sitting in a mastermind and somebody says the word holding company. And I described it like an octopus. I was like, JD, it's kind of like an octopus. And he's like, okay, I was like a business octopus. So it's like this thing. And somebody at a mastermind uses the word holding company. They start describing operators within each arm of the octopus. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm on Google there. What is a holding company? And I was like, holy God, mm. you're building a holding company. Mm. You're doing it and it feels freaking messy and it feels scary and it feels like you're taking big risks. And I'm like, okay, the worst has already happened. I'll be okay. Mm. Any favorite people you like to work with or types of people? Oh, just doers. Okay. Just do, just mm -hmm. do, just do. Like, stop thinking. And thinkers, man, thinkers. Feelers, even worse. Oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> people who feel like, it doesn't feel right for me. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I don't care what it feels like. <laughs> you have to do. Give me facts. Give me data. Tell me you did it. We can work with 1,800 things that went wrong. You're better off thinking, feeling about it. Just do. Just do. The more lessons that you learn, the more crystallized your knowledge becomes. You are unmessable with, with crystallized wisdom. And crystallized wisdom only comes on the back of getting punched in the face again and again and again. Hmm. Share with these guys, um, social curator, what that has been like for you to start that, build that, um, like where you came up with the idea, what it's been like to get, catch them up to speed. Okay, 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 okay. So let's go back to the story. This is kind of like a film noir, like a French film that's like all out of order. And oh, you're yeah. like, what the heck <laughs> is yeah. going on here? Okay, we'll so together. we talk about how we move into like a different industry. So we go from, um, go from consulting to creating a digital course. Mm -hmm. And so then we created other digital courses, each of them creating their own seven figure revenue stream along in the business. And then what we started realizing from courses that people are like, oh, we want continuity and we want fresh. And so then people come in asking for a membership. And I was like, I don't want to do a membership. That seems kind of crazy. And like, that's just too much pressure. And then what did we do? We listened to what people wanted. And I was like, okay, well, what do you want in a membership? And we just reverse engineered. And so as part of this membership, people were like, I, I don't really know what to say on social media. So then I started writing like fill in the blank captions, kind of like Mad Libs. And I would go in and be like, add your name, add your city, add your business, what you do, the three benefits of your, like literally. And then people are like, and we really don't have photos. And so I started doing photo shoots and I was taking all these photos, thousands and thousands of photos for people to use on social media. Then I would have like business coaching in there. And then we have like courses. So we launched this thing and JD and I said, well, if we can get 500 people in the first five days, well then that would be the, the ultimate success. And the first five days, we got 2,444 people to be paying us month over month for this type of content. And I was like, oh, something's here. And so then the membership continued to grow thousands and thousands of people. And then they started saying that there was a friction point between getting their social media marketing and scheduling it. And so then all of a sudden I'm like, okay, well the friction point is tech. And in order for us to integrate in all the social largest platforms so that people can schedule their content, well, we need to create a SaaS company and I've never done coding or development. And so I just did what I always do. There is the, the suck of the known and there's the unknown. And so 2020, when the world is on fire, we had just adopted our daughter and we are moved into a new home under construction. So we're living in an apartment and I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but I know I need to fix the problem. Hired a CTO. And by 2021, we launched our own tech stack to have a SaaS application. And so now people go in and they build a profile for their business. And instead of using those Mad Libs, we've programmed the back end. So it's like our AI is running through your profile, through those ad libs, giving you content and ideas, serving up what we call a social media marketing agency in your pocket for individual business owners. Awesome. Wow. Awesome. So Love cool. it. So Love cool. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This has been great. You're a busy lady. Yeah, great, you great conversation. <laughs> a lot of Thank fun. Uh, I can see why Adam speaks so highly of you. Thank so, you guys. Yeah, I Absolutely. appreciate you sharing Thank this. Thank you. Yeah. I really hope uh, someone listening right now can get some, I mean, you, dro you drop so much wisdom in, in an hour. 
I think you're going to help a lot of people. Thank with, you. Yeah, get where it going. to find all the stuff for social creator. Where's the best place for people that are listening that are interested in that? Well, I'm a firm believer. I, I'm not even going to go for the pitch. Like I have a podcast, the Jasmine star show. I, I firmly believe that you shouldn't buy something until you actually know from that person. So if you don't like me, that's just as good for me. Like go and do your research, figure out what it is. So Jasmine star show, you can get a lot of free information before you ever decide to invest. Love it. Awesome. Love it. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. All right, I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. 30% body fat. For men, this is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible, but not if you guess along the way. So we're gonna talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now there's a huge range right of like body types yeah some people can run uh a little bit heavier uh and or a little bit higher body